On top of the workers not being paid enough, at least in Marx's mind, working conditions for these industrial workers also tended to be pretty rough. Because again, this is a time period where the government didn't intervene very much in the workplace. So there wasn't much in the way of governmental regulations, which meant that you could have children working long hours for low pay in dangerous conditions, something that Marx was aware of and not happy about. While I don't think the conditions that Marx was concerned and writing about in his time are fully comparable to today, consider the following. Before they can even learn to speak, children are exposed to highly addictive and highly exploitative technology that warps not only their neurophysiology, but the very relationship they have with their own sense of self. And every year, a new device that's even better at exploiting those children gets rolled out by the R&D departments of the corporations that engage in that very profitable enterprise. Is the iPhone 14 about to be the biggest upgrade ever? And by the time those kids are, what, 10, 11, 12, their attention spans have been fully colonized by transnational multi-billion dollar corporations who, by the way, in order to produce those devices, outsource a lot of their manufacturing and sourcing of raw materials to China, who is at the very least a geopolitical rival, if not an outright genocidal regime. And all the while, the most parasitic capitalists of them all, the ones who run the university industrial complex, have deceived people into believing that the only way to be successful in life is to get a college degree, which is bullshit. And as a result, an entire generation of people have been saddled with hundreds of billions of dollars of student debt, of which the universities are not held liable for at all. And instead pass that risk on to the American taxpayer. And those college graduates who were given a completely worthless degree as a result of a small number of idiot professors diluting the quality of the education that the good ones provide. Um, Let's say so, Bezos against Stalin. Yeah, yeah. Well, which one improved more people's lives? You gonna ask me this? Yeah, 100%. The answer is unquestionably Stalin. You really right? believe unquestionably. That? You really believe that? Oh, absolutely. There's not. It's not even close. Now have no other option but to work in menial, meaningless jobs simply to pay off the debt that they were deceived into taking on. And so the fact that people of my generation resonate a lot with the ideas of Karl Marx and are generally anti-capitalist in their overall sentiment, I tend to sympathize with that. But the problem is, as I'm going to show you, that my sympathies do not change the fact that I believe. Marxism is fundamentally and metaphysically flawed to the core. And while he has a lot of good philosophical ideas at the base of his work, which I'm going to show you, they ultimately fall into the same parasitic trap that I think the modern capitalist, consumerist, corporatist society we live in has fallen into today. So now that I've gotten that out of my system, let's jump in with uh, analyzing the first central idea in Marx that we're going to look at, which is the alienation of labor. To quote Marx directly, what constitutes the alienation of labor? First, that the work is external to the worker, that it is not part of his nature, and that, consequently, he does not fulfill himself in his work, but denies himself, has a feeling of misery rather than well-being, does not develop freely his mental and physical energies, but is physically exhausted and mentally debased. This idea of alienation of labor is central to Marx's thinking. You can think of the image of the worker in a cubicle slaving away at a menial job. That's sort of an archetypal representation of the alienation of labor that capitalism has caused with people. People don't see the fruits of their labor the way that a craftsman would if he was building a chair. You could work for a company and never actually see on the ground what that company does, especially if you work in accounting or some other department like that. And as far as being physically exhausted and mentally debased, part of me, a small part of me resonates with that because uh, in college, I worked at a bar and one time I was asked to put on a latex glove and reach into a toilet to pull out a cup filled with shit, blood and throw up for $10. And I was making at the time, not minimum wage, but 50 cents above minimum wage at 7.75 an hour with no tips. And I think that's sort of an exception because I was an idiot and shouldn't have worked there and no one should have. But the idea that there are people who are forced to work in horrible conditions simply to live their lives is obviously a reality. And here's another good line from Marx. The worker therefore feels himself at home only during his leisure time, whereas at work, he feels homeless. Again, I think this is an accurate description of how a lot of people feel nowadays and how they can't be themselves at work or they have to go into work and do something they hate and then come out and live their real life and only live for the weekends. I definitely think it is a strong contributor to the crisis of meaning or the mental health crisis, which is something I'll talk about at the end of this video. But even more practically and in a way that Marx wouldn't have predicted, it's like 
Go in tomorrow at work and try talking to your coworkers about Dave Chappelle's most recent comedy special. It's like people can't even talk about jokes or be themselves in the office or the workplace because, God forbid, they might offend somebody. And it just causes people to lose the human element of interacting with their coworkers and they continue to feel alienated. So yeah, this is another good point by Marx. Now, I do think it is fair to point out that a lot of this criticism can be levied against any economic system. And you could probably make a fair case that Capitalism is the system in which these issues, you know, alienation and starvation and the, you know, being forced to work and all that. Capitalism has done the most to minimize that, especially if you live in the West and have running water and a cell phone and all that. But that is not where I want to take this criticism. I want to go directly to the fundamental philosophical base on which all of Marx's thinking is structured on. And that is his concept of historical materialism. This is where the dissection begins. Without going too deep into the weeds and putting it very simply, historical materialism is the idea that human nature and human society and the structure of life itself is fundamentally shaped, fundamentally shaped by economic class conflict. Here's Ryan Chapman to explain. So in Marx's terminology, the economic way that we organize is the basis of society, which some people call the base. And then the rest of society, like our politics and our culture, grows as a product out of that, which in Marx's terminology is called the superstructure. Now, at first glance, this idea is not only not terrible, but it's probably intuitive. The idea that economics is the foundation of human life and human society, it's like, well, we need to eat and we need to work to do that. And whether it's work in a capitalist system or whether it's hunting, it's still work and it's the foundation of human life. It's like, okay, that makes sense. And in fact, Marx gives a pretty good example of how the material conditions directly reflect and then influence the structure of society. One aspect of Marx's materialism is that the material world, literally the world of physical stuff, shapes us to the extent that we need to provide for ourselves. So within that, Marx was specifically interested in tools and machinery. So he thought that certain tools and certain machinery, like for example, the windmill, would make us economically organized in a way that would resemble feudalism. And then once we have, say, the steam mill, that requires a lot of money to start up and it requires a division of labor to run. So once we invent the steam mill, then industrial capitalism is bound to follow. So the idea that the material conditions of a society are the fundamental shaping force of that society, again, makes sense on the face of it, but when you push it to its logical conclusion, you get what I'm about to show you in this next passage, which is the most ridiculous thing, in my opinion, in my opinion, that Marx has ever said. As Marx put it, the ideas of the ruling class are, in every epoch, the ruling ideas, which he said was because the ruling class has control over the means of material production, which also gives a control over the means of mental production. And he continued to say that the class that does not have control over the means of mental production are subject to those ruling ideas. The implication of what Marx is saying here is that in any society, the cultural traditions, the religious traditions, the rituals, the myths, the art, the music, all of it is nothing more than propagandistic social machinery designed to keep the ruling class of that society in power. This isn't an entirely baseless idea because Marx would cite the example of Christianity in the Middle Ages, which basically convinced the peasants to not care about their material conditions, their horrible material conditions in life and just focus on the afterlife. And that, of course, allowed the feudal aristocracy to maintain power. But it's very difficult for me to buy into the idea that every religious text across every culture, whether it's the Bible, the Quran, the Bhagavad Gita, all of these texts going back tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years, are merely propagandistic tools to maintain the power of the ruling class in each of those cultures. It couldn't be that those religious texts are speaking to some transcendent human experience that is deeply wired in our biology. It's just, nope, all out the window, it's economics. And if you think I'm overgeneralizing what Marx was saying, read this passage that Ryan Chapman skipped. The ruling ideas are nothing more than the ideal expression of the dominant material relationships. Nothing more. Now, aside from the fact that this is essentially the basis of postmodernism, which that in and of itself is a horrible crime against humanity, this line of thinking leads to what I think is the most damaging legacy of Marxism in today's society, 
which has to do with how we view the mental health crisis. The purely materialist line of thought, which I would attribute just as much to the capitalist consumerist mindset as I would the historical materialist line of thinking in Marx, causes people to view their own problems and the problems of everyone around them as a problem of material condition. When we think about a term like the mental health crisis, that in and of itself is an attempt to medicalize and materialize a problem that I think is religious in nature, right? Treating the lack of meaning in people's lives as a health crisis implies that, well, if they just had the right material conditions and access to therapy and access to the right prescription drugs, well, then all their problems would go away. But that isn't the case because there are plenty of people who have perfectly reasonable material conditions and go to therapy multiple times a week and have access to the right prescription medication who still lack meaning and are lost in life. The issue for someone who every morning has to wake up and decide to themselves whether life is worth living enough to get out of bed isn't that they don't have enough material conditions in their life. Sometimes it is, and I need to stress that, sometimes it is. But for many people, perhaps people watching this video, the issue is not a material problem, but one of restructuring people's perceptions, their goals, their ideals, and their beliefs, and perhaps for the first time in their life, create an idea of what it means to live a good life. And I don't think that what I'm about to say is necessarily a universal solution, although perhaps it is. But if those people who lack meaning in their life decided tomorrow to dedicate their lives to addressing the suffering around them directly, then they will very likely find the meaning they need to sustain themselves in life. Just like Karl Marx did when he saw the horrible suffering of those children and decided to do something about it. But instead of trying to address the suffering around them with a prepackaged ideological framework about how the material conditions shape reality itself, people today can instead say, Marx had some good ideas, but the rest of the ideas we need have yet to be found. And so with that, good luck and Godspeed. Thank you.